Let's go. Hey, get your books. Janet Rivers Richards is down describing every nugget. Paper Bible. And you need more than one, right? Need your paper Bible. Need your Bible. Need your EP. We're learning here. Need your notebook. How, how are you taking your notes? I love this. Someone gave me this during the Pentecost. Miracle signs and wonders. Notes. Nothing but notes. You need something to write with, something to write on, and then you need a willing heart. Come on in. Yes, 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 yes. God is so faithful. Thank God for us being in class. One more time, we give God all the praise. I'm going to I'm gonna raise this up. If you're not in a church on a Sunday morning in the Detroit metropolitan area, I, I have no shame in my, in my request that you need to be in the cathedral. I will say it over and over. Uh-huh. All right. You all should really come to the cathedral. You all should be in the Sunday morning experience. That's right. You need to be in a church service, Bible study on Tuesdays. You need to get fully invested. Amen. If you're not in a church that's teaching this, if you're not in a church that's manifesting in the gifts of the spirit, what are you waiting on? Amen. Give yourself three years. I'm going to that cathedral for three years and I'm going to learn. I'm going to sit under that anointing. I'm going to be under that mantling, that anointing of Pentecost. I'm going to get all my gifts activated. I'm going to learn how to flow in the gifts of the spirit. I'm going to learn how to be free. Mother Pearl, you are still here, baby. (laughs) Tawana Bowens, I know that's right. Uh, And you wish you were in Michigan. Amen, Tawana, you sure would. I be dragging you. Tish, it works. Give me three years. If you give me three years of your life, three years of teaching, three years of investing, three years of mentoring, three years of discipleship. If you're not in a local church and you're in the Detroit metropolitan area, this is a bold invitation for you to sit in the cathedral for the next three years of your life. Give me three years, 24 to 25, 25 to 26, 26 to 27, 28, you will be ready to take the world. You'll be ready to take your community. You will improve in every area of your life. You will become more balanced, more mature. I'm not shame in my in my request. Amen. Elder Lottie, God put that in my spirit. Thank you for reminding me. If you are in the Detroit metropolitan area, that's that's Detroit all the way to Toledo, <laughs> Southfield, Oak Park, Pontiac. That's right. It's only 45 minutes away. If you are in the area, I promise you, if you will give me three years of your life, And that's three years. That's Bible study. That's prayer. That's ministers in training. That's school of the Holy Spirit. That's Sunday morning worship experience. I promise you. (laughs) I promise you. It's a different experience. It's a different experience. Doors will open for you, Tish. Am I telling the truth? Doors will open for you. Opportunities will spring forth. You will be able to function in the marketplace. You'll be able to function in the church world. You will be totally in demand. If you are in the church, if you are in a church that's not teaching the Holy Spirit, that's not teaching the gifts, that's not equipping you, you're not getting, bring your children, the power church, will train your children to be Holy Spirit warriors, prophetic men and women. They will avoid the the skirmishes. They will avoid 
the, the unclean things. They were avoiding. Bring your children. Men, you can come. We have ph phenomenal men's outreach on Thursday night. Come and sit in the midst of this. Don't just try to get it, you know, every morning. Get that. Get that. Get that. So 1030 is prayer. 1030 is prayer. You want to be in your seats, 1015. We have a tremendous prayer team that starts at 1030. Look, Jalika, give me just a few months. That's coming back on board in 2025, Sunday school, coming back on board. We haven't recovered Sunday school yet from COVID, but it's coming. Sunday school now for our children, Power Church, is on Thursday nights from 6.30 to 8.30. Bring me your children. Bring me your children. Pastor Valerie and the team are doing a phenomenal job. If you want to be in a space, I know Peg. <laughs> Woo, Rabbi, I know Peg, you show sure <laughs> Tish, and the oil will go everywhere. Look at this. I'm telling you, this, she's been with, Tish has been with us 14, 15 years old. And now God is using her in the marketplace, in the local church, in the community. I don't do anything evangelistic without this young woman of God. Because she took the oil. Praise God. Power Club from 6 to 8. Every Thursday. That's your Sunday school for your children. Any, any age from 3. Long as they, long as they can talk. From 3 on, on up to whatever. Right? Bring me your children. Good morning. Bring me your children. If you are in a place where you're not getting what you're getting in the school of holy spirit this is a bold invite <laughs> i don't normally do it but the spirit of the lord have been dealing with me about it and some of you have been slipping in the cathedral on sunday mornings this is the place for you to be bring me your grandbabies thank you jolie absolutely you know where the cathedral is 1745 east grand boulevard 1745 East Grand Boulevard. Get them in there. Six o'clock, Jolie. Can bring me your children every Thursday. So it's not Sunday school. It's Thursday school. <laughs> bring me your children. Bring me your grandchildren. Bring me your nieces and your nephews. Evangelist Tish's oil is everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's everywhere. Marketplace. Look at that, Tish. Marketplace and ministry. And it's good oil. We, de we train you, deploy you, go out and do what we have taught you to do. Hallelujah. Sunday morning, 1030. 1030. And then God moves in a mighty way. Don't be fooled. Don't be tricked. <laughs> Woo. Amen. Arnita Copeland, she's been in the cathedral many times. Good morning, Elder Barry. Love watching the Power Club. Those And those babies are growing up. Even with their homework, send their homework with them. If they're having trouble in reading, in literacy, with their math, we have people that are there that can sit with them and put that oil of the Holy Ghost on them and to help them with reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is a bold invitation. Praise God. Amen. I'm telling you right now. If you are in the Detroit area, and then if you're not in the Detroit area, look at this, look at this. If you are not in the Detroit area, pray, ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, is this the time for me to grab something to, should I, should I, should I invest in this discipleship? People go away to school. Why not go away for training in discipleship? training in ministry. This baby's been with me for 35 years. Elder Ladia was an invalid in the bed. She's been with me 10 years. And now God has used her, has trained her up, finished with a master's degree, laid in the bed for 20 plus years. Now as a certified teacher in Detroit Public Schools. Listen to me carefully. 
Holy Spirit is inviting you. This is a sovereign invitation. For those of you on IG, those of you in Zoom, if you are in a place, and it may not be for everybody, but the Spirit of God has put it in my heart to tell you, to invite you to be a part of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for the end times. Let's pray about it. Father, we thank you now that the invitation has gone out and it resonates in the hearts of people. Even now, men, women, young people, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, that you want to raise up for the end time revival. And we, God, thank you that you have ordained us to be a hub, a training center, an evangelistic center, an apostolic and prophetic center where people can come in and lives are changed forever. I can't get to the whole world, but I can train, I can educate, I can equip, I can disciple soldiers, the troops, so many officers, but not many soldiers. You have ordained us at the cathedral, 1745 East Van Boulevard, to be a hub of international and global oil, oil for the world. And everyone who comes can bear the oil in their own lives. So God, I, I ask that you would penetrate these airways in the name of Jesus. And those whose hearts are quickened, whose spirit man is quickened in the name of Jesus, that they will respond and invest and God, you will bless. You will pour out upon them. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Kimberly, thank you. Tease, God bless. Come on, come on, Tease. Bring me them grandbabies. Good morning. Good morning, Gloria Jean. God bless you, sis. A sovereign invitation. That's what the Lord just said. Hallelujah. Oil for the world. Global oil. Global outpouring. Global, global impact. Good morning, my darling, my Wendy. Your grandpapa put a seat in the cathedral for you forever. John Royster, good morning. Pastor Martha Boggs, let's go, let's go. Oh, I feel that in my shanana, in the mighty name of Jesus. Sometimes you just don't want to assume. You say, oh, I'm going to go. No, I'm telling you, this is a sovereign invitation. If you are in the Detroit area, Thank you, Dr. Aqua. Oh, Lord, I sure wish you was not in, in Texas. Lord have mercy. Woo! And you bring me your children. Bring me your family. Give me three years, the same three years that the disciples gave Jesus. And they turned the world upside down. Hallelujah. Some of you are not flourishing where you are. Some of you are not growing where you are. You're just biding time. Apostle Sonia Blackwell, my God, this young woman of God I met in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. <laughs> oh, my God. And now, I think a couple of years back, the affirmation of the apostle ministry was granted to her by the laying on of my hands. And I'm telling you, she is taking the world by storm. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. You'd be right next to me in my office. <laughs> Cheryl Larkin, let's go. This is a sovereign invitation. Neil, you've been there. You visited. I'm telling you, this is a moment. Hey, Pastor Leslie. Oh, my God. You and, my, and your family, how much I love you guys so much. This is the School of Holy Spirit. Four years now. Holy Spirit, the bondage breaker. Is our current book, Living with the Advantage, book written by me. And uh, we are talking about freedom. Freedom. Holy Spirit, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That word is freedom. There is freedom. I'm telling you right now, there are some of you that God has ordained to be in this evangelist Akiba, give me three years. I'm telling you now, God, God, God is doing some things. 
in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Scripture Cathedral, absolutely. I'll be there in July. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Get your Bibles. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. This is the school of Holy Spirit. You need your paper Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Paul's epistle. Second epistle to the church at Corinth. And I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And let's look at a very familiar passage of scripture. We know this, but I want us to read it and get it in your hearts. Paul makes a tremendous contrast between the new covenant and the old covenant. He talks about how the people of God from the old covenant under Moses had glory, but it was not a permanent glory. It was not the glory that was sustainable. I'm talking yesterday about pregnant truth. <laughs> Tish. Oh, my. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the, the present truth. We're talking about present truth. And how you can be in a space where religious bondage, religious restrictions, religious um, doctrines, uh, modalities, methodologies, have put a stronghold around you that is limiting you from freedom, limiting you from liberty. I want you to hear this. This is very important. When um, Moses and the people of God experienced all that they experienced, your grace, Bishop Winifred, God bless you, my sister. Pastor Sheila Donald Johnson. So many of you joined Kimberly Reef. Hey, sissy. Oh, wow. Amen. <laughs> I just came out of prayer at Greater Ebenezer this morning, and a member testified she received her heavenly language when Bishop Mother, that's what they call me, prayed for her last year. Absolutely. In the name of Jesus. If you're struggling receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, get to the cathedral this Sunday. Get to the cathedral. And so Moses and the people that were with him experienced something so powerful with God. Experienced so much in terms of the supernatural. Supernatural food. Supernatural manna. Supernatural water. Supernatural miracles, parting of the Red Sea. It, it was supernatural. It was something that they could never have phantom or imagined. That, that they could not let go of the former glory. I want to penetrate a space today. Because as we are reading our book, Holy Spirit, the Bondage Breaker, it occurred to me by the Spirit of God that many strongholds that the people of God are experiencing are rooted in religious experiences, religious experiences, old doctrines that that I, I, I got to open this up and I'm going to take my little time that some of our resistance even to the spirit of truth 
is because there is a religious belief that is reinforcing the stronghold. Somebody write that down. Religious beliefs can be used to reinforce a stronghold. Woo, write that down. Tap into this. Religious beliefs can be used to reinforce a stronghold. I want to dig into this. I got to dig into this. Thank you, Kimomi. Thank you, Dr. Aqua. Thank you. Write that down. Get that in your spirit and share this right now. Religious beliefs can be used by the devil, by the enemy to reinforce a stronghold in your life. Now, we're going to fight through a lot of things. We're going to fight. We're going to teach through a lot of things. But this is just something that we got to address. A religious belief, a religious conviction even. That can reinforce a stronghold in your life. <laughs> Pastor Cobra, I gotta go there. When I when I am talking to certain believers and certain people, even pastors and leaders, and I bump up against a resistance, I bump up against a resistance. Kai, Kai, Vanita, God bless you. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome, welcome. Let's go. We're in class. Second Corinthians chapter number. Let me give you a prime example. Jewish belief systems have prevented those who subscribe to it from accepting Christ as the Messiah. Let me go big and then I'll come down small. I got to dig. <laughs> Old religious beliefs, ways, legalisms, laws, doctrines. Listen to this. The people of God, God's indigenous people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, that experienced so much with God, so much that they had seen that they had experienced. But yet, when Christ came, they crucified him. Ooh. All that they had seen Yahweh do, all that they had experienced, Miracle water, miracle food, signs and wonders, all their miracle exodus from captivity, their slaveries, their bondages. And they got so, it got so embedded in them that when present truth came, they could not receive the present manifestation of truth. And their fight, their constant fight was not with evil, but with religious beliefs that were embedded in them. Some of your fight is not with sin. Some of your struggle, some of your battle, some of your actions, it's not rooted in sin. 
all strongholds are not rooted in sin. Two main areas that can captivate us. Religious doctrines, beliefs, and childhood cultures. Everybody is not fighting sin. The majority of what I've encountered in the spectrum of Christendom is not with evil, not with sin, but with religious convictions, religious doctrines that at some point may have served you well, may have served you in your life, may have brought you into, at that time, what was present true. I look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. Summer is now here. They're already out knocking on doors. I look at the Jewish people that I celebrated Passover with. Lovely people. But they have no New Testament. They have totally cut off the New Testament, Pentecost, gifts of the spirit. They're not fighting evil. They're not fighting sin. Their rejection of Christ has nothing to do with evil. They're some of the most purest, most godly people that you could ever meet. But their religious conviction has kept them in bondage to a truth that is no longer present truth. Who? <clears throat> Your religious convictions and beliefs, laws, legalisms, things that you were taught, things that you hold dear, things that someone said to you, can keep you in bondage can reinforce a stronghold that keeps you from living in freedom. Our traditions, <laughs> come on Mary, have made the word of God of no effect. Eileen Reed Capers. <laughs> Our religious traditions and beliefs will nullify the power of the word and will nullify the power of the spirit of God. When Holy Spirit comes to bring you a present truth and you look in the Bible and you say, but that can't be true. Or you remember what you were taught in church or you remember when you were in Sunday school or, or you were in catechism and, and, and you, you have made those embedded truths the final authority in your life. And then you get introduced to the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. <laughs> And he begins to bring you present truth. And you fight Holy Spirit to hold on to something that is no longer going to serve you. And that's what happened with Moses in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The ministry that brought death. The ministry that brought death. This was the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in stones. I'm in 2 Corinthians 3 and 7. 2 Corinthians 3 and 7. Which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory. 
Oh, you got to go with me. Woo. Oh, 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 oh. Kimberly says, I had a best friend that grew up a Jehovah's Witness. Once I started praying and attending church more, it was difficult to be friends with her because she challenged what I believe, especially Holy Spirit and worship music. Absolutely. Woo. <laughs> Come on, uh, Bishop. Our dean is here. Woo, shit, Honda. Here's what I'm saying to you. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 7. 2 Corinthians 3 and 7. 2 Corinthians 3 and 7. So the ministry that brought death, I want you to hear this. The government of death. Thank you, Wendy. The government of death, its constitutions, had a dazzling inaugural. Wow. <laughs> Moses' face as he delivered the tablets was so bright that day that it couldn't be sustained. It wasn't a sustainable glory. It faded soon. So Paul challenges them and says, how much more glorious, how much more dazzling is the government of the living spirit? <laughs> That's from the message translation. I love that. Thank you. Wow. How much more dazzling? How much more dazzling? Watch this. It says, the ministry of the Spirit, in verse 8, this is from the NIV, will be even more glorious. It says, I watched the theologian who says social justice is not a term Christians should use. Instead, biblical justice. Okay. <laughs> His religious upbringing is in the Southern Baptist tradition. Wow. 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 In ideology and a theology as a stronghold. Absolutely. The other day, the Southern Baptist Convention. Listen to this. The entire Southern Baptist Convention voted finally. They were outvoted this time, but there was an entire convention held and the agenda item was should women be ordained in the Southern Baptist tradition. But more than that, should the churches who are Southern Baptists be expelled from the convention because they have women pastors women leaders ordained in their local church. Now, one thing about the Baptist church is that autonomy is a real part of the foundation of our, of our existence, is that every local church is autonomous. We don't have presiding bishops and bishop courts. And, no, every local church in the Baptist church is autonomous. So you join these conventions voluntarily. Southern Baptist, National Baptist, Primitive Baptist, Progressive Baptist, they're all voluntary. Nobody can control your local church through these conventions. But listen to this. The Southern Baptist says, if you are ordaining a woman, if a woman is a pastor or been ordained in your church, then should we expel you from our convention? <laughs> are you listening to me? I'm talking about religious strongholds. I'm talking about the strongholds that are more mostly recognizable among people of God that's not dealing with sin. I'm not dealing with sin. I'm not dealing with unrighteousness. Most of you are not dealing with sin. You're not dealing with unrighteous 
behavior or riotous living. But religious bondage. Religious bondage, religious beliefs that impede the work of Holy Spirit in your life. Don't tell me about it. I fought it for years and didn't know it was a stronghold. I didn't know that the religious teachings of my local church, my beloved local church, Green Grove Missionary Baptist Church number two, had put me in bondage so that by the time the spirit of God, spirit of truth came to me, and I'm exposed now to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm exposed now to the Holy Spirit. I'm exposed now to the government of the Spirit. I'm fighting the Spirit, the government of the Spirit, because of a religious truth that was presented to me that was a conflict with the government of the spirit. I'm talking real good. I'm talking right now. When people come to me and say, that ain't holiness, that ain't holiness. I, I believe in holiness. I, I, and I just say, what does that mean? What does that mean? When you say, I believe in holiness. <laughs> Woo! What does that mean to you? Is it, is it holiness from present truth or is it holiness from some formation that you were given in your early Christian catechisms? Ooh, shut up. <laughs> watch this, watch this. Wow, Dr. Brokham is his name and he does not subscribe to any women in leadership role. He even criticized, wow. <laughs> struggle and he has no fear of sharing that or, or trying to make you believe that that's something wrong i got hit with something the other day so i was doing this um i was doing this live recording for a podcast and i really didn't know the young lady i didn't know anybody on the panel but you'll see it and i'll post it and the young lady that uh, was sponsoring it, she wanted to really get into women in leadership, women in apostolic leadership, pastoral leadership. She wanted to get into it. So she had another man that was on and um, he was very, very uh, intelligent, very knowledgeable, particularly in the area of apologetics. She had another young woman who was a doctoral, a, a PhD in chemistry. And she was on and then myself. So, you know, we're talking about and she had certain questions. And the first Corinthians 14 passage, of course, was her lead. And by the time she got to the young lady. Um, the, the gentleman was was very um theological in his answer about women being in ministry he was not against at least that's that's how he appeared but he had some restrictions i of course am wide open to the government of the spirit and then the young lady she was the youngest of all of us but she was absolutely against women in ministry, women in leadership, women pastors. And by the time the podcast ended, it was a two hour recording, three hour recording. She took it upon herself to say to me that I was in error, that I was in sin, that the passage of, of Matthew 7, uh, that Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we do this? And he will say, I never knew you depart from me. And she she placed that before me. And I said, well, I've led a, a gazillion people to Christ. I've led 
a, a gazillion people to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And she said, yeah, but you will, you will be lost. And I said, well, that's a risk I have to take. At least I've gotten souls in the kingdom. So how many people have you led to Christ? How many people have you led to the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And she was very, very adamant about the first Corinthians 14 text. Women be silent in the church. No matter how much grief we gave her, no matter how much we were saying to her from a contextual perspective, that Paul was specifically talking to married women to ask your husbands. I said, so what are you going to do with single women? She couldn't, experience, she couldn't explain it. She got tang tangled up. So her husband came in the room. He wasn't on camera, but you could hear him doing all the talking. I said, let me address you and your husband. No matter what you all say, you're wrong. Now, I'm not here to prove you wrong, and you can't prove me wrong. Because I know present truth. I don't live in Corinth. I'm not sitting in a service where my husband is separated from me. I can ask my husband at home. Paul wasn't talking about ministry. He was talking about decorum. He was talking about order. And she was so adamant, young, had a two-year-old, still birthing children. What am I trying to say to you? Many of the bondages that believers must discover in their own truth have nothing to do with sin. It has to do with doctrine. And it rises up in you. It rises up in you. It rises up in you at some of the most inopportune moments. And it nullifies present truth. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3. If the ministry that brought death was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the faith of Moses because of its glory, transitional though it was. Verse 8, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Verse 9, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Verse 10, for what was glorious had no glory. Now, in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So the transitory glory of the old covenant, which was not sustainable, now a greater glory has come, which is permanent. Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to present the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. Wow. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. And even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory from the Lord, who is Holy Spirit. Wow, Sean. <laughs> if the government of condemnation was impressive, 
how much more this government of affirmation, bright as the old government was, it would look downright dull alongside of this new government. If that makeshift arrangement impressed us, how much more this brightly shining government that has been installed for eternity. With that kind of hope to excite us, nothing holds us back. Unlike Moses, we have nothing to hide. Everything is out in the open with us. He wore a veil so that the children of Israel would not notice that the glory was fading. They didn't notice it then. and They don't notice it now. They don't notice that there's nothing left behind of that veil. And even today, when the proclamations of that old bankrupt government are read out, they can't see through it. Good God Almighty. Because only Christ can get rid of it by his spirit. Now, this is a very obvious discussion. The contrast between the Jewish system and the system that Christ introduced to us. The system that Holy Spirit affirms in us. Remember that under the old government, the glory was not sustainable. But now the glory of the Lord rests upon us and rests within us, Christ in us, the hope and expectation of permanent glory. But yet, because some of us were raised in an old glory system. Some of us never heard of the Holy Spirit. Some of us never heard of the baptism of the Spirit. Some of us never dealt with the gifts of the Spirit. Some of us have never been exposed to it. And now we're coming into present truth. But the doctrine of old, people are still fighting tongues. People are still fighting the, what happened on the day of Pentecost. People are still fighting the gifts of the spirit available to all believers. Why? Because of the former glory. Some move from the glory of Moses and the government in which he inaugurated. And they move into the government of Christ. But some who move into the government of Christ have not moved into the government of the spirit. Why? Because truth is always moving and expanding and enlarging. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so many times when we see what people do and we condemn it, it is because someone told us from an old system that that was not holy or that was not of God let me go back to the dancing in the sanctuary let me use that because that's current and that's fresh and that happened in our church during a Christmas party of 2023 we put on some good old jams <laughs> as we always do And there were those who were among us. There were those among us in our church affiliated with us who felt that they, we should not have been doing that. Now, that comes from an old government. Those of us who have been in the cathedral for, for some time wasn't anything wrong to us. It wasn't anything that had any sin attached to it or ungodliness or unholiness. But some who had just come in, some who were drawing in to us, they were stunned or shocked. And this is how you can always tell that condemnation is a part of it. Bishop, I thought you was holy. I didn't know that this, you did this, and you can hear the condemnation. 
because that's the spirit in which they speak from, the old government, the legalistic government, not the liberty of the spirit. And they felt, they felt a genuine rejection. They felt a genuine <laughs> kind of resistance. And of course, I don't condone getting on Facebook discussing nothing that happens at the cathedral, but they did. But they were so un, 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 I guess, shaken by it. And I'm, I'm talking what happened in the cathedral. And I had to sit with them and say, hold it. What is the problem? First of all, the business of the cathedral does not belong on Facebook. That's the first thing you have to stop. You don't rebuke nothing at this cathedral in social media. You come to me. I'm the chief intercessor here. I'm the chief worship leader here. I'm the one that if I'm wrong, I'm the one that's got to fix it. So we had to clean that up. But then, <laughs> Lisa, she said, just messy. Then I had to dig into it. And I said, now, where, where is this coming from? Where are you getting this from? That this is sin or this is wrong? Well, you know, I was taught, I said, who taught you that? Who taught you that? And so we just kept digging in it and we just kept pulling at it and just until I got down and I said, can you show me something from the scriptures? Or is this just something that was communicated to you from someone that you trusted and someone that you love? And this is what you now want to bring here to the cathedral. Now, I've been pastoring this church for 38 years. And I've been in this church. I'm one of the founders for 52. So tell me what it is that you're challenged by. And let's let me get to it. Oh, whoo! It was it was deep, folks. It was deep. <laughs> but what I had to keep digging and keep showing them as a shepherd that this is a religious stronghold. This isn't present truth. This is a religious stronghold and it is not done to offend you. It is not done to offend you. But it is our truth. It is a freedom that we have. We don't go to the clubs. We don't go out. This is where we dance. This is where we enjoy. This is where we party. This is where we this is where we go deep. This is where we love each other and fellowship with, with each other. If I'd have carpet in here, we would roller skate. <laughs> this is where we get it all done. This is where we, we are, by the spirit of God, we are engaging in koinonia, in Christian fellowship. Now, I need you to understand this is not going to go away. And ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because Holy Ghost party won't stop. We're not drinking. We're not fornicating. We, but we do enjoy each other. And what I want you to do is examine what it is that you believe that is wrong with this. And then come back to it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Thank God, thank God. Listen to me. Present truth of the spirit. Present truth of the spirit. I, I, I want you to hear this, that the government of the Holy Spirit is a greater government than the government of Moses. That the government of Holy Spirit is a more surpassing glory than the government of Christ. 
and that we are living in progressing truth. That we are living in expanding truth. And that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Y'all, y'all, y'all not gonna say nothing to me. I'm teaching, I'm teaching. <laughs> what I want you to understand is how much of religious bondage is reinforcing your strongholds. Not saying. Not evil, not unrighteous behavior, but religious restrictions, religious teachings that reinforce certain strongholds in your life and nullify the word of God. I'm teaching better than you shout. I'm teaching better than you should. See, what I come up against as a woman is not witchcraft. It's not sorcery and witches and wallet. No, no, no. I know the difference. But what I come up against is religious bondage. Religious restrictions. Religious bondage that are no longer present truth. I'm not talking about moral issues. You know morality. You know that you shouldn't do certain things. You, you know that. I'm not talking about moral issues. I'm talking about belief systems. I'm talking about belief systems that have limited your freedom. I fought God for 30 years because I could not believe that he was calling me to preach when my whole life I've been told women can't preach, that God would not call a woman. Do you hear the arrogance of that? Do you hear the arrogance that human beings say what God will not do, what God cannot do? Do you hear this? And some of you are in those systems. Some of you are sitting in those systems. It's your local church. It's your family structure. Some of you are sitting in those churches that have taught against the Holy Spirit. You're sitting in the midst of it. Some of you are in the place where you worship where you sow your tithes, where you give your offerings that have put restrictions based on gender, have put restrictions on the power of the Holy Ghost, have put restrictions on the gifts of the Spirit, and you're sitting in the midst of it. And every time they teach it, the veil comes on your face. Every time they teach against the tongue, speaking in tongues, the veil comes on your face. Every time they teach against healing and miracles, the veil comes. You're sitting in it right now. You're sitting in the place that is teaching you against present truth. You're supporting a system that is teaching you against the system of Holy Spirit. Maybe your mother taught it to you. Maybe your grandmother taught it to you. Hey, Pastor Daryl, maybe, maybe somebody else gave that to you and you love them so dearly. And they reinforce it in your, I don't believe, listen to this. I don't believe Bishop Vaughn has dancing in the sanctuary. Wow, she sure has changed. I don't believe that. That's what she does. So it reinforce, the veil comes right on your face. The veil comes right back over your face. Whew. And they learned it from somebody else. 
and they got it from somebody else. We're not fighting sin. Those of you that are, you know you are. Most of us are not fighting immorality. Most of us are not fighting robbing banks. Most of us are not fighting with our own appetites. Most of us have mastered that. You're not fighting with those unclean things that you've been delivered from. And if you are, then hang on. I'm coming for that one too. But the most of what you're fighting with is religious doctrine that is reinforcing strongholds in your life. And that's why you have problems with your flesh. That's why you have problems with your flesh. Because your religious doctrines, religious dogma, legalism will not sanctify you. That's why you still argue and messy and gossip and smoke and do those things. That's why, because the ministry of condemnation will never set you free, will never deliver you. You will try to follow laws. You will try to follow rules and still not free. You'll still, you'll try to follow legalistic laws and restrictions, but you're still not free. Because the ministry of condemnation can never sanctify you. Ooh, religious doctrines will never set you free. Rules and regulations will never set you free. The ministry of condemnation will never set you free, although it may have had some glory in it. It was not sustainable glory. Religious dogma will never deliver you. Religious bondage will never deliver you. You may abide by the rules because you're afraid, but it will never set you free. The ministry of condemnation will never deliver you. Margie, it will never deliver you. And many of you are trying to live by certain rules and regulations, and then you want others to live by those rules and regulations because you want to be in a system of, of bondage. You want, that's all you know. That's all you've been exposed to is the ministry of condemnation. Oh, you do that, you're going to hell. Uh, oh my God, that's what you're doing? you going to hell. Oh my God, I can't believe that's you. What? you going to hell. The ministry of condemnation is a ministry of fear. It's a ministry of fear. It's not a ministry of liberty. It's not a ministry of the spirit. It's not a ministry of loving kindness that draws us out of darkness and puts us in the marvelous light. It's not the ministry that will affirm the righteousness that you are in Christ Jesus. It's just condemnation. You go into hell. You go into hell. They go into hell. What? They go into hell. Gee, what Jesus? He, he didn't die for that. There's no blood for that. There's no reconciliation. There's no redemption. They go into hell. Really? And many of you, that's your language. Everybody go into hell. I heard it the other day. Somebody put it on the post. If you if you haven't Acts two thirty eight, if you if you have not uh, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 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 if you're not if you didn't do that, you're going to hell. I, and I reached out to the young man. I said, you can't be serious. So everybody that's not born in Apostolic doctrine, not the apostles doctrine. The ap apostolic doctrine is going to hell. So the church of God in Christ is going to hell. The Baptist is going to hell. Everybody going to hell except those that Acts 2.30. I said, do you know how ridiculous that sounds? And he came back. He said, no disrespect, Mother Bishop. So and so. I said, listen, I'm not going to fight you on your page. But that can't be true. But that's the bondage that they're in. 
the fear of letting that go, the fear of accepting, of inclusion. People still fighting whether God is one or whether God is three. Still fighting about it. We we can't. I was sitting with Dr. Anika, and she was sharing with me that she was opening the doors to those that were on the margins. And there were people in her own leadership that said, I can't believe you. I can't believe you. I'm so disappointed. Here comes the ministry condemnation. I can't believe you're going to let everybody in. I can't believe that you are opening the doors of the church to those that are on the margins. So what is this going to be? Is this going to turn into that kind of a church? This is what's among us, folks. We're not fighting robbing banks. We're not fighting shooting people down in the streets. We're, we're not fighting that. We're fighting religious dogmas that have come to reinforce strongholds in your life. That's, that's what I believe that the spirit of God is saying to the church in this hour. If the ministry of condemnation had glory, how much more glory it's in the ministry of the spirit. But you can't see it. You can't see it. Oh, they, they committed suicide. They go into hell. Who says this? Where did you get this from? <laughs> oh, my God. All gay people going to hell. They going to hell. You're going to hell. Everybody going to hell. Really? Then what was the whole purpose of the cross? What was the whole purpose of the blood? What was the whole purpose of Pentecost? But that's the ministry of condemnation. And most of us are not fighting, murdering somebody in the street. We're not fighting habitual lying. We're not fighting whether or not we're going to rob the bank or knock the old lady in her head. That's not our stronghold. Our stronghold is religious doctrine religious doctrines i remember one time and i got to get out of here i was looking at benny Hinn. this is years and years ago and i've been taught so against the baptism of the holy spirit all my life i've been taught so i've been taught against tongues taught against speaking in tongues taught against the baptism of the spirit taught against all of that passed away just keep me locked into the 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 dispensation of Jesus Christ. Nothing came after that. I was taught against it. And I remember watching Benny Hinn. I was somewhere preaching. And I was in Baltimore. I was in Baltimore. I was down at the Inner Harbor. <laughs> Woo, come on, Dad. Come on, Zoomers. Come on. And oh, my God. I was sitting there just talking nasty about how in the world? What is he doing? At that time, you know, he was young. He was swinging his coat jacket. He's always worn white. And, and people were just falling out. Just, just falling out. <laughs> wow. Hey, Tyra. God bless your granny is in heaven now. Oh, praise God. Heaven is rejoicing. You have our, you have our deepest condolences, darling. Listen to me, Carol. I was just, the next day I turned it on. I'm watching people just falling out. Y'all remember he would just wave his coat and the whole audience would just, I said, thank that is not God. That is not God. That ain't God. The next day I turned it on watching. I'm in a revival. At that time revivals was all week. And the next day I turned it on and I said, oh, now I don't know why I'm watching it, but I'm watching it and condemning it. And I'm sitting on the bench at the, the bed bench at the foot of the bed in this beautiful, special hotel down at the inner harbor. And the doggone bench gave way and I fell off on the floor. I was like, what in the world? I got up, I sat back on the bench and I just, I'm just arguing. It's nothing about this this time. The next day I turned it on again. And I'm condemning it. I'm condemning it. The next day, I turned it on. I fell on the, the bench, gave way again. This is the honest truth. And when I got ready to get up, I pulled up on the bench and got on my knees. And, I, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, 
This is my work and my servant. This is my work and he's my servant. And it was such a conviction. I had been sitting there condemning this man four days in a row. Probably had condemned him before that. But was still drawn to it. But drawn to condemn. Because of a religious doctrine that I was taught that none of that's for today. Now, if you're taught that, if you're taught that by someone you love and someone that you really care about and you're in the local church, you believe it. He <laughs> said she was there and you were at Evangel, Lord have mercy, Evangel, Lord have mercy, Donnie Mears and Pastor John Mears, those are my Lord have mercy. She waved that coat at me and the Holy Spirit said, this is my work, Doc Brock and that, and he's my servant. I got up and I said, Lord, forgive me. But I had been taught that none of that was right. That none of that was for today. And when you are taught that, you begin to believe that. And when you see something different, the ministry of condemnation and the stronghold that is reinforced by a religious doctrine given to you by a religious leader or someone dear to you, you condemn the spirit of truth. You resist the spirit of truth. You resist present truth. A few years later, Archbishop Idahosa invited me to Nigeria. I'm preaching crusades there with him. We go to a place called Kaduna in northern Nigeria. The Muslims and so much was there. But there was a preacher there, a pastor there, a church there that was under Ida Hosa at the time, Bishop David Ayedipo. Many of you may have heard of him. He's a very well known now. At that time, he just had a church in Kaduna, a little gold, old Mercedes. And the three people on the ticket was Archbishop Vincent Ida Hosa, Evangelist Carletta Harris, and Benny Hill. And we went all the way through northern Nigeria, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the three of us together. That religious bondage, that religious doctrine, that spirit of condemnation that I had that was a stronghold would have prevented me five, 10 years later from ever being on the same stage with Benny Hinn. I got to go. <laughs> Woo, the ministry of condemnations. And this is why our churches are not moving forward. This is why churches are not growing. This is why you are not. This is why your ministry is, this is why, Dr. Marshall, because the ministry of condemnation, although it had glory, it was not sustainable glory. And now the ministry of the government of Holy Spirit has a far more surpassing and permanent glory and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I got to go. <laughs> Don't miss class this week. Get other people. Share this on your pages. And let's get down to the root of every lie that we have believed. That we have accepted as the truth. But it's not present truth. I got to go. <laughs> Ooh, hallelujah.